So thank you everyone for uh, inviting me to speak on what we're doing uh, with AI and machine learning at Red Hat. And I wanted to introduce you to a project that we have going on here called the Data Hub. The Data Hub started off as a reference architecture for how we are doing AI uh, within Redshift, uh, sorry, uh, OpenShift, and then some other technologies, some other, other open source technologies. And it has spawned off into also solving internal problems at Red Hat. So I'll just speak through exactly what the Data Hub is, how we're using it, and then how we're kind of pitching it as a reference architecture. So you can think of the Data Hub as a collection of open source components and the foundation of it being uh, uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. But some of the things that we're tying into it is being able to do data streams, store big data, do model training, uh, execution of those models, uh, basic ETL requirements as well, uh, providing APIs and then visual visuals and reports on top of that. In terms of why we created the Data Hub, we were initially tasked with uh, solving some of our interesting uh, build issues that we were having at Red Hat for continuous integration, continuous delivery. So the Red Hat, uh, the Data Hub actually spawned off as a way of us aggregating and collecting all of that information. It quickly was moved into the AI as a service type of category when we started to think about, well, as we're collecting all of this data, what can we start to infer from it? Uh, and then also enabling other teams to do that. So what we've tried to do is provide a platform that will take some of those mundane repeatable tasks, such as if a build fails or if there's some insights that needs to happen on, on log data or, or metrics data, you know, taking those repeatable human tasks and starting to automate those. And what we found is that that's a great way to augment our core business by and giving the developers the ability to, to automate a lot of these tasks. And it just makes things a little more efficient on our end. But in order to do that, the first thing we had to do, which is why it's called which the data, awesome. was to unify that data. And some of the things that we talk about when we start to describe AI and ML, AI is like the new BI, right? Uh, everyone says it, but they're, depending on who you're talking to, it has different connotations. So one of the things that we did in, in the Data Hub team and the a, uh, AI Center of Excellence, which is you know, part of the Data Hub, uh, which is what the Data Hub team reports into, is we had the level set on what do we mean when we say machine learning, artificial intelligence, and how does that stack up against uh, some of the other things like statistics and predictive analytics. So the bread and butter of the Data Hub, we focus more on the right side of this chart when we do things like natural language processing, autonomous uh, decisions, uh, and also uh, you know. Um, anything from uh, anomaly detection, those types of pattern recognitions, that's really where we're focusing on and where we have our data scientists spending a lot of their time. From an architecture perspective, this is where we get into when I mentioned uh, we are using the Data Hub as a reference architecture. Uh, we've at the core of the Data Hub, we use, you'll see on the left side of this is Ceph Object Storage. Uh, that is basically our, um, uh, we're using that similar to what you would use S3 as if you were in Amazon's infrastructure, uh, where that is our data lake. We have lots of different types of data that's stored there. Anything from Red Hat Cloud Services, we have data pumping into that. We also have uh, metric data coming in from services such as Prometheus. Uh, we also have uh, data that's more operational in nature. And then we also have uh, just basic customer information that we store there, support tickets, uh, feedback loops, things like that. Uh, and we use that as a collection, uh, a way to collect all of that data. Ceph is, Ceph is great for streaming data into those systems. We also use Elasticsearch for more of our raw log analysis. Uh, so sometimes when you have, you know, just, just terabytes of log data coming in, uh, you need an engine that will allow you to, to quickly sift through that information to do some kind of visualizations. So we use Elasticsearch for that, for that use case. And then we use Yan, uh, YanisDB, JanisDB, however, wherever you come from in the part of the world, you might pronounce that differently. Uh, but we use a graph database, uh, YanisDB, 
and that is for some of the work that we're doing with um, uh, stacks and uh, doing intelligent stack recommendations. So if you are deploying a stack that's focused on artificial intelligence, uh, giving you recommendations on, hey, you might want to add these packages to it, or uh, your packages may be becoming out of date, here's the impact on your system. And so we use a graph database to handle those, uh, those types of use cases. On the ingestion side of things, we are using uh, Kafka. There's a, uh, a project called Strimzy uh, that will uh, be part of AMQ as well. So the Strimzy uh, project is all on Kubernetes as well. Uh, we use Logstash. We have a homegrown uh, ShipShift instance, which basically takes uh, Jenkins artifacts from our build systems, uh, pumps it into our system, so that we can analyze those artifacts. We also use OpenWhisk. Uh, if you're familiar with serverless actions, OpenWhisk is an open source technology for those serverless actions. And that allows us to do things uh, you know, with data as it's coming in streaming. So we can do some kind of AI or ML on top of the data as it comes in. On the analytics side of things, we use for the ingestion and processing of the, of the data coming in, we use Spark. Again, that's on Kubernetes. Uh, that is a project called Rad Analytics that we're leveraging uh, their technology for Spark on Kubernetes. And then we also have Jupyter Hub that we've deployed and Jupyter Hub allows our data scientists to get access to the data in Ceph and Elasticsearch uh, using Spark as the processing engine, but then also they can use um, uh, other images uh, other types of notebooks as well, such as Scikit-Learn, PySpark, and things like that. And on the reporting end, we have Kibana. So we use that for our basic visualizations that's hooked into Elasticsearch. We are looking to expand on that to have more of an open source BI tool sitting on top of the data. Uh, but as of right now, we're focused mostly on using Kibana for those visualizations. All of that rolls into our service layer where we have something called a common AI library. And the common AI library, you can think of that internally, uh, our use case for that is as our data scientists on our team and, and, and other teams are creating these analytical models, uh, there's a life cycle that has to happen where they may play around with things, but then as they play around with it, they publish it into the execution in engine. And then we say, well, you know what? That was actually pretty cool. I think other teams might like this anomaly detection. So we're building out an AI library that allows the data scientists to take those models and put it into a place that other teams can leverage it and just you know take that mo take that model, deploy it, but then pass their own data through it and get some results out. We're doing that uh, in a number of use cases uh, that we just started out, and we'll be publishing that AI library pretty soon. All of that sits on top of monitoring and alerting. We use Prometheus and Grafana for our monitoring. Uh, and alerting needs. And then we also use ElastAlert. Again, all of this is sitting on top of OpenShift. Uh, so everything can be deployed uh, pretty rapidly in multiple environments. I'm gonna skip this. This just kind of shows the, the OpenShift side of things. Uh, a, a basic workflow that I'll show really quickly is how we have several different data sources. Uh, this top part here is going to show a little bit how we consume data into Elasticsearch and Kibana. We have various data ingestion services that pull in data from various uh, build systems, and we take those logs and we pump them through Kafka, uh, again, with the Strimzy project, and then we do some kind of normalization on that data using Logstash FluentD. We've since actually expanded our normalizers to now include, uh, we do some Kafka connectors, that's not anything new, uh, but we also are using case SQL. So we'll be replacing some of the Fluent D and Logstash normalizers uh, with case SQL running on top of OpenShift. This lower uh, flow right here is how we get data into Ceph. And so this just shows you we're taking a lot of performance data. We have data from an IT data warehouse, uh, sauce reports, uh, again, build and test data, and we use workflow a, a workflow manager. Right now, we're using Jenkins, but we're also looking into switching to something more akin to like an Airflow, Apache Airflow, uh, and we'll be testing that out as well. But today, we use Jenkins for uh, basic uh, Jenkins and cron jobs for our basic workflow management, and then all that data ends up in the Ceph. 
what we'll be working on in the very near future is to com combine these two workflows to where data flows through to, to Kafka. Uh, and then from Kafka, it goes both to Elasticsearch and Ceph. So that's a little bit of a, a modification on this flow that we'll have. Uh, on the data, on the model designing side of this, this is just to show a basic use case of how we have data coming in, landing in Ceph, and then uh, the data scientists, they use Jupyter Hub right now, uh, along with Spark to get access to the data that's stored in Ceph. And we use uh, a combination of Hadoop and uh, Amazon drivers to get access to that data. We don't actually use Hadoop underneath the covers, we just use uh, their 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 um, uh, their jar files to get access to it using Spark. On the deployment and execution side, well, what happens after the data scientist takes their data model and deploys it? Uh, usually, they team up with a data engineer, and we have a number of different environments that they can deploy it on. If it is more of a streaming data coming in or, or ad hoc requests coming in, we normally push that to our serverless actions. Uh, an example of that is uh, we just launched, uh, uh, actually um, uh, next week we'll be launching a sentiment analysis service. That sentiment analysis service will exist as an open WISC action so that as data is streaming in from various systems, we can do an analysis on that data uh, in real time and then process the results and return uh, results back to users. Uh, but then for some of the batch uh, jobs that we have, such as model training or doing a batch execution of a model, then that's when we go back to the workflow engine and, and the data usually comes in off of Ceph to do that training. So there's a little bit of combination of both. The other thing we're working on, uh, which would be part of the serverless actions as well, is the feedback loop. So as models need to be revisited and, and corrected for accuracy, uh, that's going to be done through the serverless actions as well. An example of that is for the sentiment analysis. If uh, the entity detection or the sentiment analysis of that data comes back incorrectly, then we're, we have mechanisms, uh, we have APIs uh, that are going to be hooked into a UI that allows the end users to modify that information. Uh, and then uh, uh, we retrain the model based on that information that came in. And then on, flip, on the tail end of this is where we get into the uh, AI and ML side of things, we provide a number of different libraries for the data scientists, including the Spark ML library, Scikit-Learn, NLTK, Keras. We're also very uh, soon going to be rolling out TensorFlow with GPU enablement. Uh, hopefully, in the next you know month or month or so, we'll have uh, that as something available to the data scientists to work on. Again, all of that being uh, part of uh, OpenShift. And uh, we'll continue as we have more types of AI and ML models available, we'll be adding those to the, uh, to the images that we have to make them available for the data scientists. And to kind of wrap this up, I, just, I talked a little bit about some of the services that we have. This is just kind of uh, go through some of those again. Uh, for our cloud services, we're doing anomaly detections for infrastructures. So, you know, some of our customers that are on the cloud services, uh, we're kind of actively monitoring the collective nature of all of our customers to, to see interesting patterns. And then we're working with the service teams to uh, help either resolve issues or, or, or offer up new, uh, uh, new opportunities for customers by, by analyzing that information. And then on the customer, uh, on the sentiment analysis and entity detection, uh, we have an ongoing project with a number of teams where we're, we're looking at support tickets, uh, looking at feedback from uh, engagements with customers, deployments of customer environments, uh, fe feeding all of that data back into uh, the data hub and providing insights on what customers are talking about, trending information, um, you know, what's, what's working, what's not working, you know, any kind of information we can use uh, to help out from a, a support side of things. And then we also provide visualizations on top of the data hub to analyze the build information that comes into the system. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we provide a lot of images, a lot of containers. And so we do a, we do a lot of work with the various teams at Red Hat to, do, uh, to assist with the container validation, uh, doing recognitions of issues that might come down the system and, and, and help them analyze that data as well. 
The future of the data hub, one of the things that we notice as we talk to customers is that there's a strong need for data governance uh, when you're talking about uh, deploying uh, an, an MI, ML as a service or an AI as a service platform for an organization. Uh, because you're now centralizing all of that information and centralizing uh, the access to that information, it becomes very important for you to add the right level of security, metadata, lineage, auditing capabilities and whatnot on top of that. So we're actually working with a number of customers to identify uh, a commonality across all of the customers and provide recommendations and also loop that back into the internal data hub so that we can uh, add on to the governance. So we're looking at things like uh, OPA as well as um, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of the Apache uh, products to help us get through the data governance side of things. And then on the AI li model lifecycle, we need to elaborate on the use case of storing the models. Uh, so giving a proper repository, also working with promotion from dev, test, prod, and then providing uh, performance monitoring of how that model is actually executing in production, uh, whether it's accurate or inaccurate, how, how it can be more efficient, and then also backups of those AI uh, models. So that gives you a rundown. That's an that's overview of where we are with the Data Hub and AI as, it, as it's being worked on in Red Hat. Uh, and certainly it's uh, very challenging but interesting. Uh, and we will be publishing uh, very shortly not only articles on, on what we're doing with, uh, with the different deployments of the Data Hub, but then also providing all of uh, a public Git repository as well as uh, Quay um, images so that anybody can take this deployment of the data hub built on top of OpenShift and uh, put that in their own environments. And that is it. Hey, um, this uh, Dave Ronchek. Um, uh, really, really cool stuff, and certainly I, I've heard uh, a lot of these um, problems over and over again. So I'm really excited to hear you working on them. Uh, I was wondering, is there something we can do in Kubeflow to make zooming this easier, or integration with uh, the services that you're providing easier? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. I can't believe I didn't I didn't bring up Kubeflow and all of this. Kubeflow is very much at the forefront of what our team is looking at as well. Um, so we're doing a lot of investigating with the TensorFlow and getting um, uh, an integration with Kubeflow. So that I don't have any strong answers as to how that's going to turn out just oh, yet, but, but we do have lots of engineers working on integrating that with the rest of the ecosystem, especially as it deals with you know, the first pass of it is is making making Kubeflow available for the data scientists, um, you know, through the UI, and then once we do that, working on the deployment side of it. And we've looked at a number of different tools to help out with the promotion of models. We just haven't narrowed down on one that we really like just yet. Yeah, no, that's t totally okay. I just was going to suggest, uh, uh, you know, we are happy to help. Um, uh, Kubeflow is very much at this phase where. Uh, while the, the core is, is uh, doing uh, very surprisingly well, uh, we really want to get real-world uh, usage of it, and it, it looks like you're already leaning into a bunch of cool stuff. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out and say, hey, you know, it would be a whole bunch easier to integrate if we did X or, or Kubeflow did Y or something like that. Uh, I'd love to take that on. Awesome. So I will definitely uh, catch up with you on that then because uh, yeah, we, we've been dabbling around with it, and I think if we can have – more targeted focus, then that could help us deliver something quicker.